Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. And today we're beginning a mini-series all about the traditional weapons that have been used throughout Chinese history. Weapons, of course, have a key role to play both in battle and in Chinese martial arts. In classic novels and traditional stories, a great practitioner of the martial arts is often described as the master of 18 weapons. These 18 weapons include the bow and arrow, dagger, sword and spear, to name just a few. To put all this into some historical perspective, evidence has been found suggesting that bows and arrows were the earliest weapons used in battle in China, and that it was during the Stone Age. Like many other weapons that developed later, bows and arrows were originally used in hunting. Well, as rival tribes came increasingly into conflict with one another, so our earliest ancestors began using their weapons not just against animals, but also against other people. The weapons they used were very primitive. Some have disappeared from use over the centuries, while others have been developed and have assumed more sophisticated and deadly forms. According to Chinese martial arts, the longer the weapon, the stronger it is, but the shorter the weapon, the more deadly it is. Throughout the history of Chinese martial arts, weapons have been an inseparable part of Kung Fu. Bows and arrows make it possible to attack a target from a great distance. Swords and daggers, cudgels and spears make an attack close up more deadly. In ancient China, most weapons were made for use in battle. However, as time went by, weapons of war found their way into civilian life, and they greatly enriched Chinese martial arts. According to statistics, there are more than a hundred types of weapons used in Chinese martial arts. But of these, swords and daggers are the most important. Obviously, weapons were already in existence long before Chinese martial arts skills were developed. What were the earliest weapons used in China? Zhou Kou Dian is famous as the site where Peking Man was discovered, but also found at the site, which dates back 600,000 years, were many stone hammers, knives and chisels, of which have sharp edges. In primitive society, these objects fashioned from stone served as both everyday implements and weapons for hunting and even fighting animals. Over time, people learned how to use these weapons more skillfully, although strictly speaking, they were not really weapons, but simply tools used for acquiring food. Real weapons, as such, did not appear until the Bronze Age. During this era, bronze weapons made in China were said to have been fashioned under the supervision of Chu Yo, a mythical king. It is said that Chu Yo made bronze swords, spears, halberds, and bows and that he used these to defeat 21 rivals. In order to take control of the entire central plain, Chu Yo declared war on Huang Di, or the Yellow Emperor. Both sides met in battle at Zhuolu. 
There it is said one day the Yellow Emperor defeated Chu Yo using magic weapons and then had him executed. This is a famous story in the mythology of China. While this brought an end to the story of Chu Yo, he became revered as the inventor of military weapons and consequently the god of military affairs. Although Chu Yo is credited with the invention of many weapons, it is believed that Huang Di, or the Yellow Emperor, was responsible for the invention of the sword. The famous Chinese book, The Art of War by Sun Bin, a work on warfare found in a Han Dynasty tomb in the Yingchua Mountains in Lini, Shandong Province, attributes the invention of swords to Huang Di. The bronze dagger axes, spears and halberds said to have been invented by Chu Yo later became the main weapons of the Bronze Age. In his Ode to the Fallen, Chu Yuan, a poet of the state of Chu during the Warring States period some 2,500 years ago, gave this account of a fierce battle in the period before the rise of the Qin Dynasty. The two belligerent parties first shot arrows at each other's positions, then they charged at each other in chariots. The soldiers in the chariots, armed with spears, dagger axes and halberds, engaged in a bloody battle. In eras prior to the Qin Dynasty, fighting mainly took place from chariots, and so obviously, swords were not the main weapons. Fighting from a chariot required the use of long weapons, such as spears, dagger axes and halberds. However, in traditional Chinese culture, swords are much more than simply weapons for battle. They command more respect than any other type of weapon. One may ask, why is this so? In eras prior to the Qin Dynasty, swords were not common. According to law, only members of the upper classes were entitled to wear swords, and aristocrats wore them as a symbol of manhood. According to Sima Qian's historical records, when Qin Shi Huang, the first ruler of the Qin dynasty, was enthroned, he wore a crown and a sword. It would be unimaginable today for two states to go to war over the ownership of a sword. Yet it is said that during the Warring States period over 2,500 years ago, the state of Jin attacked the state of Chu in order to seize Tai e, its treasured sword. At the time, the state of Jin was the most powerful state in China, and its king felt he simply had to have the precious sword. Chu was militarily inferior and as a result of the conflict, it lost most of its cities and its capital was besieged by Jin troops. In the end, the king of the states of Jin gave Chu an ultimatum. Give up the sword, or we will attack your capital tomorrow. The Chu king responded by climbing the city wall and crying out, Tai e, I will shed my blood today in your honor. Tradition has it that he then pointed the great sword at the enemy troops. And at that very moment, sand began to fly about and stones hurtled through the air at the invading troops encamped outside the city walls. In no time at all, the invaders were wiped out. Now, no one has any idea what ultimately became of the sword known as Tai e. Fortunately, though, we do have the sword of King Gojian of Yue, which is just as famous as the Tai e sword. While an archaeological survey was being carried out in an ancient tomb of the state of Chu in 1965, many swords were found, the most interesting of which was made of bronze. This bronze sword is known as the Sword of King Go Jian of the state of Yue. The sword was found sheathed in a scabbard which had an almost airtight fit with the body of the sword, and when it was unsheathed, its blade was found to be utterly untarnished. A simple test conducted by the archaeologists showed that the blade could be used to cut through a stack of 20 sheets of paper with ease. 
After experts of Fudan University in Shanghai carried out scientific tests on the sword in 1977, it was concluded that the sword was made chiefly of an alloy of bronze and tin, with small amounts of lead, iron, nickel and sulphur. But how was this treasured weapon forged? Zhang 硬度降低了，它的韧性就能提高。那么就是它使这个剑呢不容易折断。Swords such as the sword of King Gou Jian were forged with unique and complex techniques, and they were, of course, for the use of kings only. So, what kind of weapons did everyday martial arts practitioners use at that time? The Rites of Zhou, a book about the rites practiced during the Warring States period, tells us that ordinary people were allowed to possess short daggers, axes and wooden sticks as weapons. They were not, however, permitted to own weapons of war, such as halberds, spears and dagger axes, and nor were they permitted to wear swords, as these were considered symbols of power. However, assassins used daggers that resembled swords. These daggers were much shorter than the swords seen in the hands of aristocrats. Perhaps the most famous conflict between the wielder of a dagger and that of a sword in Chinese history took place when Jing Ke attempted to assassinate the king of the state of Qin. When Jing Ke unrolled a map scroll, he seized a 30 centimeter dagger hidden within and lunged toward the king. The king responded by trying to unsheath the sword slung at his side, but was unable to. After a court official mimed the action of slinging the sword across the back and drawing it across the shoulder, the king finally managed to draw his one meter long sword. He then killed the would-be assassin. In this story of a clash between dagger and sword, the dagger of an ordinary man is defeated by the sword of a king. Following the assassination attempt, the king became more aware of the importance of weapons in his rule of the country. Shortly after he unified China, he confiscated all bronze weapons owned by ordinary people and had them melted down to make 12 bronze objects symbolizing the inviability of his government. As a result, when Chen Sheng and Wu Guang launched a peasant uprising at the end of the Qin dynasty, they had only wooden weapons with which to attack the Qin troops. The latter were armed with strong bronze weapons. Among the figures in Qin Shi Huang's terracotta army, are the common weapons used by soldiers, such as bows, arrows, long-shafted dagger axes, spears and halberds. But there are also bronze swords, which were used for close fighting. These swords, each more than a metre long and extremely sharp, were highly effective. Chemist 
特别是刚的，底部呢比较韧，这样的话就不容易折断。所以到了这个战国晚期，到了秦统一的时候，这个时候青铜兵器已经发展到它的一个最高的最高峰了。所以剑的长度不断的从六十厘米加长到七十八十，甚至于到一米过过。超过一米，这样呢，在秦始皇陵的兵马俑坑里边出现了这样的青铜剑。The Qin Dynasty was the first peak in Chinese history, and the dynasty's swords represent the pinnacle of the Bronze Age. But just as people were beginning to feel amazed by these long bronze swords, their weakness became obvious. This weakness was due to the very nature of bronze. 它就很容易断折，啊，就是你中间那个中级啊，剑的中间那个部分叫鱼级，中级部分太厚的话，影响的剑的分量，影响的剑剑的这个这个锋锐度，啊，在和对方的兵器碰磕的时候，又容易断折。Bronze swords are inherently weak and so likely to break. And under the Qin Dynasty, they were already falling into disuse. By the time of the Han Dynasty, which followed Qin, swords were being made of iron. In the last years of the Warring States period, China began to make iron. At that time, Iron ore was smelted at low temperatures, and so the iron produced, referred to as spongy iron, suffered from tiny holes and was far from tough. But during the Western Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago, steel was produced at high temperatures, and this made all the difference. At the Nanyue Royal Tomb Museum in Guangzhou, one can see ten famed swords of the Han Dynasty, symbols of the great achievements of that era. Each of the swords is more than a meter long and very sharp. They're made of steel. Weight,就是两个字，非常伟大。可以说我第一次看到这这十把剑，尤其是说寓意、立策的几把长剑，顶底确实我感觉心惊动摇。因为我个人来说，这是我见过最伟大的中国剑，对不对？为什么呢？这
，呃，杂质，还有它里面一些气孔啊，什么东西、啊，呃，给它打密实，呃，然后呢，这个材料呢，才能达到一个刚柔相济的一个特点。To make a hand sword, the steel must be forged over and over again, and the many processes involved in making a single sword must be carried out in accordance with strict standards. There were, in fact, as many as 16 steps involved in producing a single top-quality, flexible hand sword. As the steel swords of the Han dynasty were sharp and hard to break, they were much more lethal, and they were damaged much less easily. All this naturally improved the combat effectiveness of Han dynasty troops. In addition to swords, the other main weapons used by Han troops included bows, arrows, and halberds. During the Han dynasty, there was a clear division of labor, so to speak, among bows and arrows, long shafted halberds, and swords. In open areas, bows and arrows were used to attack the enemy. Long shafted halberds were used to fight at close quarters, and swords and shields were used in close combat situations in confined spaces. It was during the Han Dynasty that swords gradually lost their purely military function, as it was at this time that the Imperial Sword appeared. The Imperial Sword was a symbol of supreme authority that invested the bearer with unlimited power. Han 的时候呢，就出现了一种特殊的，我们说的这种特殊意义上的一个兵器。甚至就是超出兵器本身的一种极端权力欲的一种兵器，那就是上方宝剑。这个上方呢有两种写法，一种是高尚的上，还有一种是上下的上。实际呢，它是出现于汉的一个机构，它出现一个叫做少府。少府呢有这个上方令，上方令的负责上方令的呢叫做上方丞，丞相的丞。那他们做什么呢？他们主要是呢，最早是做一些皇帝的，也就是说皇帝御用的一些。器把玩器，一些御用的器，当然包括一些礼器和一些把玩器。而这个上方宝剑呢，从此以后呢，就是做皇帝呢，就作为什么呢？本身来说，皇帝他做了请这个上方做了这个剑以后呢，他可以赐给大臣。就是当他本身不在场的时候，大臣可以拿这个剑呢，作为内外杀伐，这个出外定夺，所谓将在外，对不对？将将在外就是自己来说执行这个是皇帝，他就是一种皇皇权的象征。他可以持持有这个剑者呢，可以代表皇权的意见，就是对于相当职位的官员呢进行杀伐。It was precisely because of this discretionary power that the etiquette system of the Han Dynasty required officials at all levels to wear swords. This then had an impact on ordinary people, with many scholars developing a fondness for swords. The celebrity Dong Fang Shuo of the Western Han Dynasty is a good example of this. As we know, he began to learn sword fighting at the age of just 15. It is also recorded that the famous writer Sima Xiangru was not only good at writing, but was also skilled with a sword. As the Han Dynasty progressed, it grew more and more obsessed with swords. But then the Xiongnu people of the north began to attack the borders of the empire's territory. Xiongnu cavalry posed a significant threat to the Han Dynasty and Han people began to doubt the efficacy of the use of swords in battle. Faced with attack from the more flexible Xiongnu cavalry, the Han dynasty found itself in a passive role when restricting itself to traditional chariot fighting strategies. Moreover, the swords used by Han-mounted soldiers were clearly inferior to Xiongnu broadswords. The Han armies quickly discovered that the most effective weapon against the Xiongnu or Han cavalry was the broadsword. Both the Han cavalry and its infantry stayed using the single-edged broadsword instead of the smaller double-edged sword. 
By the time of the Three Kingdoms period in the 3rd century, a thriving weapons industry had developed based on the production of the new single-edged swords. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers and tuning again next time for more about traditional Chinese weaponry. I'm Chi Xiaojun from CCTV International. See you next time.